this week on the Back Table Podcast. We had never met the new neighbors. We've never seen the orthopedic surgeon. And, you know, at the party, she found out that I was a radiologist and I was practicing in the same hospital as she was practicing. And she had just started there as well. And she went on complaining on how she had been looking for a radiologist willing to do shoulder ultrasound because she had seen how it worked in Seattle when she was in, in her fellowship. And I told her, I'm your man. And I've been that man ever since because she really knows that she has started up my practice. And at the same time, I, I can unpretentiously see, say pretty much that I also contributed a little bit to her practice as well. And uh, she has been a very much a proponent of uh, ultrasound. Everybody who knows me and knows her, who she is. And she's been, uh, you know, kind of the first supporter and the main supporter. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Backtable MSK Podcast, your source for all things musculoskeletal. You can find all previous episodes of our show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on Backtable.com. I'm Jason Cox, a practicing musculoskeletal interventional radiologist in St. Louis, Missouri, and today I'm interviewing Dr. Marnix Van Holsbeek, one of the foremost experts in the world on ultrasound specifically musculoskeletal ultrasound. I'd like to welcome Dr. Van Holsbeek to the show today. And uh, Dr. Van Holsbeek, how, do, how would you like me to address you? Uh, well, Jason, I, my parents called me Marnix. It's a Dutch name. So I'd prefer you call me by that first name. Great. That sounds good to me. So Marnix, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, Jason. I'm Belgian-American. I'm dual citizen. Uh, and when I say dual citizen, I'm actually, I lived in Belgium for 33 years and then moved to the United States, and I've lived in the United States for 33 years, so it's kind of evenly split. I'm a son of a primary care physician in Belgium. Uh, my father was trained in dermatology and syphilis treatment and moved to a very small practice in a city called Rousselaar, Belgium, about 40,000 inhabitants. When I um, was 18 years old, uh, I told my dad I wanted to become a fiction writer. My dad told me... Uh, I know several physicians who were very good fiction writers, so why do you, don't you first become a physician and then pick all the hobbies in your life you want, which in retrospect probably seemed a very sound advice. <laughs> at, the, uh, at the age of 24, I was put to work in my dad's practice as a, a general practitioner, really in the Van Holsbeek family, medicine kind of runs in the genes. I had uh, I did that parallel with my radiology training, so I did that for seven years, no vacations, no leisurely time. All my weekends, all my vacations were spent in private uh, practice, general medicine. Wow, that's that's pretty extensive and somewhat different than how we train here, you know, in the United States. But I bet having all that background in general practice really um, prepared you for for radiology. No doubt. So how did you first discover musculoskeletal ultrasound and what made you want to become an expert in it? Well, for that, again, I have to circle back to that practice with my father. I, I wanted to at some point take over the practice and really become a private practice um, primary care physician. Or if that wouldn't work, if my dad didn't want to leave the practice for me, I wanted to become a gastroenterologist. Uh, again, my I took my father's, I was the oldest one of three. I took my father's advice when he said, you know, first look at radiology practices. He said, well, radiologists are the doctor's doctors, and and maybe you should take a look at what radiologists do. So I did that in some of my clerkships, spent some time with radiologists, and I liked it. The only thing that disappointed and uh, was a little bit disappointing to me was that there was in my opinion, not enough uh, patient contact. Up to the point when I actually saw practice work with ultrasound, and I said I, I really would feel comfortable. I like, you know, the the combination of uh, my love for images, but also the love for uh, patient histories. I always like to sort of unravel patient's history. I like to be in the in the in the thick of it. Listen to what they had to say. Listen to what their problems were. And, and I thought that, you know, ultrasound in terms of imaging kind of solved that drive for um, interest in patients' lives. Yeah, that's interesting. I think um, 
you know, I had a similar experience myself. Uh, when I went to medical school, I had planned on being a uh, sports medicine family practice and then, you know, just instantly fell in love with the radiology part of it. So it's, that's interesting that you had that similar experience and guidance from your father. So that's pretty interesting. We're going to talk today a little bit about the history of musculoskeletal ultrasound because you grew up with it. You know, you were there from the start, I believe. And was there a special, you know, moment or, or maybe tell me about the first time you encountered ultrasound? What, what year was that? That was like 1980, 1979. Uh, yes. It was even during my training as a, still as being uh, trained as, as a medical student. Wow. And, and, you know, if you go back and you look at the history books and even the technology uh, of ultrasound, which has evolved rapidly and come, you know, very leaps and bounds at different points in the history, it's very interesting that in 1980 that you became so fascinated with it. You, you must have been very precocious in that regard because back then, you know, tell me about the environment that ultrasound was compared to other fields like CT? Well, I mean, at that time, it was in my uh, rotation on gastroenterology which where um, they were starting to do some of the um, ultrasound for gallbladders. And uh, just uh, being able to see through the skin, you know, the first real-time scanners came out, um, being able to see a, a, gall, a gallbladder contract, see the stones move around. I, I, I thought this was just fascinating and be, being able to talk to the patient while you were doing it, seeing if, you know, whatever stones were there were somehow related to the patient's symptoms. I thought that, you know, putting the patient's history together with the images was just, was just the uh, most fascinating thing. Yeah. Now, for most of us, you know, the young guys in the room or, or around, you know, I finished residency in uh, 2014. You know, it was routine to see a gallbladder. It was routine to see these things. But it still wasn't routine to see musculoskeletal ultrasound then. Many people would consider you one of the godfathers of MSK ultrasound. Can you share with the audience from your historical perspective the development of MSK ultrasound over the years coming from gallbladders to imaging tendons and muscles? Well, when, when I came out of residency at that time, my reading took me in a couple of different directions. I, I'd read about Baker cysts at that time. Um, I've read about visualization of synovium. I think it was Cooper Burke from Vancouver who had written about that. I've also read about some uh, publications from the United States that came at that time. I was still practicing in Belgium, obviously, at the time. I read about uh, what Middleton was doing in St. Louis, your hometown, and I was mm -hmm. also reading about what uh, Mac was doing in Seattle uh, on shoulder ultrasound. And at the same time in Europe, there was uh, a Bruno Fornage who was publishing on uh, tendons. Uh, some of those early pioneers contradicted themselves, and and I, I was you know reading back and forth you know tendon imaging. I listened to Fornage once talk about shoulder ultrasound. He said shoulder ultrasound has no future because you can't see the small tears. So I I kind of was fascinated by that because I had already done you know some plunging into this field. And actually seen that it was possible to see smaller tears. I did a lot of arthrography as, as an MSK trained radiologist. And I had always done all my, every single arthrogram. In those days, you know, we're not talking about MR arthrogram. We're talking about single contrast arthrogram. So I did all my, all my arthrograms in parallel with ultrasound. And when something was leaking through, I said, if it leaks, it must be visible. And especially once you the standard of contrast, uh, I was able to track the fluid and understand. You know, I did it before and after. I was understanding better, you know, how tears, uh, where they were, potentially how they may develop and, and how they could be visualized on a routine basis. So uh, I was there to see a number of different uh, separate publications. Um, and I'm very flattered you call me one of the godfathers. Uh, you know, I... I was perhaps the first one to realize that there was a career in this. And and that kind of came through the practice of my father. And when I was uh, practicing in, in the uh, setting of a primary care physician, we were injecting, and when I say we, my dad and I were injecting left and right tender spots. Uh, we had to inject and I had to look up how you inject uh, a joint blindly. 
so we had to in the practice do that blindly then I kind of thought if we can put two and two together if we can actually see it and then inject it that would be a tremendous step forward I, I saw a void and I was very glad to be able to step into that void yeah that's that's very interesting and you know I've been to some of your lectures or many of your lectures and you know I've, I've talked to a lot of your sonographers too and you know they always say that you say if you can see it with an ultrasound you can approach it with a, uh, a needle or a procedure and you know I, I now you know you saying that kind of makes me realize how how far back and how long you've been thinking about this and studying it and and you know making these interventions possible yeah in that respect uh, you know and it was probably 1985 when I started working with orthopedics and uh, one of the surgeons came up to me and said you know I have this patient here with a total hip and I placed this three or four years ago and now this patient has fever I'm pretty sure it's from the hip. Can you aspirate it? And you know, I'd never thought about that, uh, doing this with a total hip. And we put the transducer on, saw the fluid, put a needle in, and we were able to prove that it was indeed an infection. We were able to culture the, you know, to culture that particular bacterium. So that brought a lot of excitement in my practice, I must say. Yeah, and that's that, and and that's still applicable today. You know, that's that's one of the most commonly requested. Uh, procedures in my practice so it, it uh or you know iliopsoas bursitis status post hip replacement you know i'm I, i'm doing tons of those <laughs> so that's interesting that back in 1985 that was that was a problem moving forward in time you know you have developed a very successful program at henry ford uh with musculoskeletal ultrasound that i personally haven't heard described any other place um, i trained at university of missouri you know, we were doing, you know, between 10 and 15, maybe 20 ultrasounds a day. The, we didn't have sonographers that actually did it. It was just myself, you know, the fellow, uh, Dr. Julia Krim and several other uh, attending faculty, Dr. Bronte Arrow and Dr. Ingalls and Dr. Stanner were all just, that was it. We had, you know, we had four people that did these aspirations and injections with an ultrasound machine and the diagnostic portions too. You know, we didn't have a sonographer that was capable of doing it. Can you tell us about the development of your program over time and, and how it became so successful? Well, you know, in setting up the practice when I came to Henry Ford uh, in 1989, uh, I kind of applied to or tried to apply what I would call the, um, the 300 feet rule, meaning any ultrasound you do for orthopedics or for rheumatology um, in the same breath or for PMNR, whatever the practitioners are, the referring physicians should be, your equipment should be placed within a distance of about 300 feet. Um, why is that? Well, because the real thing that ultrasound brings is the real-time aspect uh, of ultrasound, but also the fact that you can actually deliver answers to patients, to physicians, on the same day, in the same patient visit. So that's what uh, we tried to accomplish. At that time, I actually was first hired as the, uh, the head of the Division of Emergency Radiology, so I started doing ultrasound in the emergency room, did a lot of um, infection aspirations there, kind of starting from the abscess, you know, the, the whole works as we do it now for infections. Mm -hmm. But uh, as orthopedics then became involved, the, uh, they wanted to have us close to where they were practicing. So we moved our ultrasound equipment in orthopedics. And we've been ever since been applying the same thing. You know, we moved to the satellite clinics. We moved ultrasound uh, again within a distance of about 300 feet from the orthopedic practice. Um, we've been doing that. They have been building a sports center, uh, the uh, performance center for the... Um, the uh, basketball in, uh, in Detroit for the Pistons. So we also moved our ultrasound in the same uh, building, uh, very close to where the patient examination rooms are. We, we have scheduled, I mean, don't mistake it, we do have scheduled patients, but we always have the opportunity to add on a patient on a ad hoc basis. And that has been very successful because when somebody comes for uh, as you well know, for either a tear of the quadriceps or the patellar tendon, you, as surgeon, you can't sit on that for longer than a few weeks. Actually, ideally, you should do surgery within the first 10 days after the injury. So 
we do add them on. We do give the um, the answer back on a on an ad hoc basis. You know, immediately after the uh, patient has been seen in the ultrasound unit. You know, and in the very beginning, uh, my colleagues were saying, "Well, why would you want to practice in the lion's den? And why would you actually put your ultrasound machine in orthopedics? We physically put it in orthopedics because they're going to take it over." Well, I think if you think like that, you're actually missing the point. The point really is the patient, and the patient, the patient has to be. When they come in, they have to have their problem solved. And if you can do this faster than any other uh, imaging technique or faster than any other uh, way of diagnosis, uh, you you solve the big problem for surgery. And the surgeon really is out there to do surgery. They're not out there to do ultrasound. They really want to have answers for their patients. And the closer you move your uh, diagnosis to the time of injury, the more success you're going to have in your practice. Yeah, you made a lot of great points there that I've actually uh, implemented in the outpatient basis in my unique practice here in St. Louis. You know, we have a um, you know guarantee that patient will be seen the same day or the next day, and that's been a huge part of my success working in an outpatient based lab setting. So that's that's very interesting that you said that, and I love your uh, three hundred foot rule. That's that's great. I mean, um, I, I hadn't heard that before. So I, at University of Missouri, we did the exact same thing. I just didn't realize you had minted it. <laughs> so, well, I, I didn't cool. mint it. Actually, I saw it in a practice in in Brussels before I left. There was it was not ultrasound. Oh, yeah. It was actually fluoroscopy. But they also in the, in the in the French University of Leuven uh, in Wolleway, they actually did the same thing. They were very close to where uh, orthopedics and they were you know they were in cahoots together. And, and and very gotcha. interestingly, when I started, there was a, a, a chair who, of orthopedics who came from Boston. His name was Eric Raiden, and he his line was um, it was <laughs> a very dirty line, but that, that kind of it kind of abbreviates everything I'm saying. Is that you know he said he immediately understood what I was saying. He said yes, indeed. He said the MSK radiologists and the orthopedic surgeons have to pee into the same pot. And I think uh, <laughs> that just sums it up. And and it's yeah, not that really does. It's, it's not only seeing the patient; it's also giving the patient's answers. And for me, the excitement is when I see something new. I just step out of the office and I talk to orthopedic and I say, "What sort of device did you place now? What what is this? I, I've never seen this before." So I have I have answers back. I'm not only giving answers; I'm receiving answers too. Yeah, that's my experience as well. I come across a new orthopedic device on the weekly basis, it seems, and um, it's kind of fun to collect those and, and learn more about them. So that's a good segue, really, because you know you're talking about this 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 program you have, and we didn't really talk numbers, but how many cases are you doing on a daily basis on average for musculoskeletal well, ultrasound? I can give you exact answers that that can that can vary from twenty to forty. But, you know, I, what I can give you is uh, our system now. You know, when I started, uh, I actually checked the numbers for 1989. You know, I started in December of 1989. That particular year, there had been 40 studies over the entire year that had been labeled as being extremity ultrasound. Right now, extremity ultrasound, we do 16,000 studies a year in Henry Ford. Amazing. And something that we have talked a little bit about before is that, um, and something I've experienced in my region is that a lot of the patients, you know, they, they're basically required to get an ultrasound of specific injuries before it ever goes to MRI. Is that, is that the case that you have too? It depends. You know, there's certain areas that I don't think we are going to take anything away from our, from MR, for example, knee meniscus. You know, occasionally we do in a meniscus because there is a discrepancy between the symptoms and uh, and the MR study, but typically we haven't really touched on that much. But there are certain I just mentioned quadriceps and patella tendon tears. You know that's I really think is the domain of ultrasound because you can do it when the patient first visits, and you can tell the surgeon do surgery. Same thing for a distal biceps tear in the arm. You know, it's a mm-hmm. it's a split it's the split decision. Is it's it's a binary a binary option. It's either torn or not torn. It's surgery or no surgery, and those things have to be decided quickly. 
and and a surgeon, you know, sending the patient back, waiting on the MR appointment, then waiting on the report, then scheduling the that that is a week or two weeks that just just right there in many places. Uh, so it depends. A foreign body in the in the in the musculoskeletal system that potentially has affected the joint, for example, that's I think again that's domain of ultrasound. Uh, certain nerve imaging more and more uh, becomes, you know, that's something between neurosurgery and us. That also becomes ultrasound as well. So yeah, it depends on what what type of injury you talk about. It, I think the two are complementary. We haven't we haven't taken any business away from MR. Uh, to the contrary, we actually brought new business. We do about nineteen thousand MRs, so we do a little bit more than we do ultrasounds. But you know, the two go parallel. If you if you do a good service. You get good MR as well, so uh, both are, are complementary studies. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point to make. Us in the field of musculoskeletal ultrasound, we're not trying to take away; we're trying to add here and and create value and make better patient care. So that's that is a great point to make. And then you know you will see things online or you know when people are talking that hey, ultrasound isn't good and and then and, you know this kind of makes a, a good segue to uh, when you're talking to orthopedic surgeons, you know, they, you know, my experience, and please tell me your experience, is I, you know, I work with um, probably, you know, on my outpatient basis, you know, I probably work with about a hundred different orthopedic surgeons that refer to me. And, you know, I have orthopedic surgeons that will send me a case maybe once a year. And then I have orthopedic surgeons that send me cases every day. But uh, the ones that send me one case a year, it's because the patient can't have an MRI or can't have, you know, contrast for a CT or, you know, there's some reason that they can't get the preferred method for the doctor. And the, and I've spoken to them as, about this before and they say, I love what you do. I, I respect what the ultrasound can show, but I can't understand the images. Whenever I get the images, I don't know what I'm looking at. So um, what, what is your experience with that? Well, similar. Um but more and more, though, you know, after 30 years, our orthopedic surgeons are becoming quite versed in looking at the ultrasound and understanding it. Also, knowing the weight of certain things. We, if we stress certain areas in our report, you know, things that are important, uh, they they sort of, I wouldn't say blindly take it over, but at least you know they they put great trust. And, and I I think. For some of the MR, it's the same thing. You know, if if you're talking about bleeding here, bleeding there, they do rely on our uh, interpretation as well. But you know, I th- I think I think overall, with more and more practice, they become v- very well. Uh, they're so busy, you know, they don't have the interest in doing it because do- doing doing good ultrasound, as you all know, needs a bit of training and it needs it needs dedication. That's not something a surgeon necessarily. Who is very busy in practice uh, has an interest in doing. Right. Can you tell me about your experience working with the orthopedic surgeons and gaining their trust and acceptance, and how you do actually work with them in musculoskeletal ultrasound? Yeah, I. You know, when I came to Henry Ford, I I really taught orthopedic surgeons on what ultrasound could do for them, and and the rest kind of followed. You know, I, the the first thing I did was. I told the orthopedic surgeons, for every MR you uh, order, I can offer an ultrasound for free. And I did that for about one month. And it didn't take longer than a month before everybody was convinced that, you know, there were a number of things that immediately became obvious that they said, for example, the quadriceps and the patellar tendon, they didn't didn't go first order this and that and then wait for the wait for the uh, appointment to be made. You know, they they went straight to extensive mechanism of the knee equals ultrasound kind of uh, a first line a first line shoulder exam became uh, the norm and very frequently that was followed by surgery if it was if it was necessary if if they had an, an additional question the labrum had to be examined then they ordered mr so a number of those things became clear as we as we progressed naturally through this process now there was only one exception, actually, and and that's kind of a funny story because uh, I told you that I moved from Belgium to the U.S. At that time, I had we had my wife and I had three kids, so I have three little Belgians with us, 
and then we had an additional <laughs> an additional child who became our first American. So it was number four, uh, who was born about in that time when we uh, were here for the first couple months. So we looked for a house from when we were still in Belgium to settle in the United States. And after we settled in the house in uh, Northville, Michigan, we found out that the orthopedic surgeon of an, an, an orthopedic surgeon had moved into the same neighborhood about within a month's within a month's time and and she had been looking at two houses in the neighborhood the house that we settled, we settled in and then the house that she finally settled in so a couple of months later it was christmas it was christmas party in the neighborhood we had never met the na- the new neighbors we've never seen uh, the orthopedic surgeon and you know at the party she found out that I was a radiologist and I was practicing in the same hospital as she was practicing and she had just started there as well. And she went on complaining on how she had been looking for a radiologist willing to do shoulder ultrasound because she had seen how it worked in Seattle, uh, you know, when she was in, in her fellowship. And I told her, I'm your man. And I've been, I've been, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've been that man ever since because uh, she has been already, she, she really knows that she has started up my practice. And at the same time, I, I can unpretentiously see, say pretty much that I also contributed a little bit to her practice as well. And uh, she has been a very much a proponent of uh, ultrasound. Everybody's going to know who uh, knows her. I mean, who knows me and knows her, who she is. <laughs> and she's been, uh, you know, kind of the first supporter and the main supporter. Yeah, that's a great story. And that's, that's not unusual. You know, it, it seems like kismet. But it seems like, you know, doctors that are passionate about something tend to talk about it. Yeah. And uh, that's how I find a lot of my business is I'm I'm just a loudmouth, you know. I'm telling everybody about this <laughs> stuff and, yeah. and they find out about it. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's a great story. So speaking of training, how is it, you know, because I, I now have stenographers that are certified in musculoskeletal and are experienced with it. But when I grew up in it, I was the only person, you know, whenever I came out of training, I was the only radiologist in my practice of 82 radiologists that had trained in ultrasound. So any of the cases, you know, I had to go do them. How is it that you built a successful training program with sonographers to get the sonographers to the level that you need them to be, that you can trust what, what what's happening and have reliable results? Well, I, I think part of it came through necessity. Our practice grew so fast exponentially in the early 90s that it was impossible for me to be in, you know, in two or three different places at the same time. So we, in the beginning, we struggled with that a bit. I must, you know, admit just the same. You know, Mm -hmm. over 30 years, the first five years probably were the most difficult. At that time, we were looking for a good fit. You know, how could we train a sonographer? Because there was there was nobody who schooled in it, uh, there was nobody available to do it right away. So we thought maybe it should be uh, somebody who is has ultrasound experience, but maybe went to X-ray school, uh, being an RT before they went into ultrasound. So we were looking for somebody who was both RT RT specialty, a, a, a radiographer, and a sonographer because we thought they should have some insights into the bone anatomy. I mean, bone anatomy, that's why it's so intuitive for MSK radiologists to do ultrasound is if you know where the tubero- the greater tuberosity in the shoulder is, you can find the supraspinatus. It's, it's just, it all goes ben- back to skin and bone. So uh, the first sonographer took us about a year to train, took us a long time. The second sonographer went fast faster because they had the mentor around to train them. The you know they they learned from their peers teach peers you know sonographers teach sonographers right and uh, what took a year in those days probably takes three months at this point now we we have come to a, a split in time where or we come at a division now where we have added to our two year uh, sonographer program we have added a four month uh, MSK uh, ultrasound training. And we are actually looking for accreditation of the program, which would be the first in the U.S. We've trained now three different classes. We have excellent students come out of that. They are trained in OBGYN, they are trained in abdomen, 
and their sonographer skills are very good. And so much so that I think this year we're going to deliver 12 of those. So very good sonographers who are um, skilled in multiple different uh, anatomies. That's, that's amazing. It, I think the last time I looked at the numbers, the number of actual RMSKS in the United States was under 600. So putting mm. out 12 in one year is, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's an amazing feat. It, I mean, it, in, in the, in my area, I know of only, I think five sonographers yeah. in the whole Midwest, you know, the whole greater St. Louis area that are RMSKS. So that, that's, that's pretty good feat. What are some of the challenges with training a sonographer with musculoskeletal as opposed to, you know, say abdominal? Yeah, I do not think they're diff any different from training radiologists in doing sonography is that, you know, as physicians and as sonographers, we come out out of training and we have very little musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal anatomy background. In medical school, there's so much to teach. And, you know, if you right. know the number of layers in the forearm of muscles and tendons, you know, that's, that's quite a complex anatomy. So doing that training is, 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 is foreign land for many. And I think in the beginning, uh, but I think our, our, um, uh, Lori Geiger, our, our sonographer, the head of the sonographer school who is doing the training of MSK does a phenomenal job. She teaches the anatomy. She has them make drawings of the anatomy, go back to the plastic model, go back to the skeleton. I mean, just, just like you would for orthopedic training. And, and obviously four months, if four months can do the job, uh, there is, there is a future for MSK sonographers. Yeah, I agree. One challenge that I've seen just in my history of training sonographers is that they're very timid when they first start because of that anatomy. You know, they're not in that educational program like you have set up there where they have all this support. And again, I'll say that about radiologists too, you know, even, even musculoskeletal training route radiologists that went to good programs that didn't have the ultrasound there. So this applies to both radiologists and sonographers. What bit of advice would you have for, you know, a sonographer or a radiologist that wants to grow up and become a MSK ultrasound guru? Well, there are many, many advice so at this point, at this point, you know, it keeps the landscape keeps changing. Uh, and and we'll talk about a little bit of what we are doing with our point of care imaging institute. Is that I think what is what is needed is continuity. And I for the last thirty years, you know, when we when we first started, when I came to the U.S., um, I have a very good colleague and friend up to this point. We have been working together, Joseph Intrakasa from Wisconsin. You know, we we recognized there was a void in the world. I mean, there was a big thing, a big task to take on. And we started the uh, Musculoskeletal Ultrasound Society because we wanted to create awareness of the fact that ultrasound is there and it's there to stay and it, it, can, it can weigh up against any other imaging modality. So we did this for 30 years. We're still doing it. And we are meeting this year in Peru. A bit difficult choice there uh, politically. But at the same time, we realize there is a big landscape forming here or there's there is a lot of a lot happening on the on in the homeland here in North, North America uh, where ultrasound is in movement musculoskeletal ultrasound definitely uh, has been in a focus of attention but there is really when people go to meetings when they pick something up they pick up the transducer they see the with the current technology there is so much one can see so much anatomy it's so overwhelming and one has to start somewhere. And I think you come back home and you and you start practicing. You see, well, boy, I learned that and that and that. But I can only reproduce, you know, one tenth of a percent of whatever we, whatever I learned. I think a couple recommendations. I myself, I'm not going to make an advertisement here for any particular equipment, but I, I bought myself a little butterfly, uh, the the ultrasound machine that I can attach to my iPhone. And why is that? Because not for training, but because my you know my kids and my grandkids have a, an ache an ache here and there, uh, and and I can very frequently solve those aches by just putting the transducer. I can can keep them out of the ER. I can keep them out of the hospital sometimes. And if it's needed, if it's needed, they're going to go to the hospital. But I think if you have that couple thousand dollars laying around, buy yourself a, a small unit and. Whatever you take from a meeting, 
start practicing right away. Man on woman, woman on man, you know, spouse, whatever, on your kids, on your grandkids, uh, and solve the problems from daily life. I mean, those those aches and pains are there all the time. So that's the second piece of advice. And the other thing is, you know, we are organizing now a semi-annual meeting once every six months. Come to the meeting. We do one joint a year. This year is shoulder joint. Next year is going to be ankle and foot. And take it home. Mull about it. Think about it. Practice it. Come back. Ask questions. I kind of think this is a, a new concept. And I, I, I take it as what I'm mirroring at is I'm looking at the, um, and I'm thinking of the old Roman times, the Roman Forum and the Greek Forum where everybody was coming together in the markets and they brought, you know, they they brought, Socrates brought his philosophy theory. He was bouncing it off on his colleague next door. I mean, that's the way we we should learn because, you know, right now the technology is there to do your ultrasound in your in your own house. Yeah. The technology is, is, adva- is advanced over, uh, over the practice, and I think we can we can we can solve that by by uh, bringing it kind of as in the Roman Forum or the French the French Salon where people were discussing you know the the problems of the day. The same thing for imaging, I think it can be done as well, and it, it's a daily learning thing. So I mean, those are the couple things of advice. Yeah, that's great bits of advice there, and I think a lot of radiologists are you know, just by nature, curious and do those kind of things. And, and I, I kind of did the same thing. You know, I bought a butterfly, I bought a Lumify, you know, I, I've tested out the, you know, the GE, the, the Clarius. And, um, you know, I just had kind of have an ultrasound with me at most times. And, you know, it's interesting to take a look at a, um, uh, you know, my nephew, it's, uh, you know, three months old and look at his cartilage and, you know, there's, there's not, you know, you can see these things. So it, it's pretty interesting. No doubt. The non-invasiveness, you know, no radiation, nothing. In real time, you can move it and yeah, you can study it, no doubt. Yeah. So just to clarify, this biannual meeting that you're having, what is the name of your organization that you're doing that with? It's Point of Care Ultrasound. It's Point of Care Imaging. And we we are actually have an HTTPS point of imaging uh, dot US. Great. Yeah. And you know, I, I came to your first meeting of that and it, it was a wonderful meeting. I got to meet a lot of sonographers that had much more experience. You know, it was, it was more of a norm to have sonographers, the, the ones that you work with. And then there was also a good group of sonographers that had never even seen this before. So I, I, I thought it was very promising to, to see so much um, enthusiasm. Whatever meeting of ultrasound and MSK ultrasound in particular I'm going to, I'm always learning something. I learned, you know, learn a new hand position. I learned a new, a new little trick, and we learn from each other. I mean, that's that's kind of the forum or the salon type of setting. Is that it's an open thing, you know? It's a, it's a, it's it's a bilateral learning thing. Yeah, you learn a lot from bouncing things back and forth. Exactly. Or just, you know, there's so much that hasn't been seen or published about already. Hold up. You know, just finding things every week that that are new. Like uh, in my clinic, for instance. Um, I've developed somewhat of a um, clinic that focuses on uh, snapping hamstrings. So, you know, these patients have completely yes. normal MRIs, nothing against MRI again, but then they show up over here, then I have to hold this probe against their uh, their hamstrings and have them do squats or, you know, have them bend yeah. over a certain way or have this clunk, you know, reproduced and chase this down so that the surgeon can go, go treat it. Hold up. And, you know, all of that stuff just hasn't been talked about. There's too much out there. You can't you can't publish an article every day. That's the, that's the issue, right? Yeah. Right. That's that is right. Yeah, this is a good point. To uh, we've talked about this this outreach that you're doing with uh, ultrasound. Tell me about this Antarctica trip that you're taking, and uh, that actually we're going together. So, tell me about what what why you want to participate in a MSK ultrasound program in Antarctica. Well. I, I think I already talked to you that in the past. I, I read Shackleton's memoirs twice. You know, I've been fascinated by Shackleton, a person, you know, unlike Amundsen who made it to the South Pole, you know, he made it through failure and he made his crew, he he, he brought his crew back to the mainland um, in a safe place, you know, a, a tremendous adventure. 
it's the sort of it's the end of the earth, uh, and that's kind of the way I look at it. Is it's nobody had been ever, or at least we don't know if ever if somebody has ever been living there, but nobody has been living there unless some. Um, the only exception, maybe some explorers, some um, um, some researchers. Uh, it's a place where you can look at the sky with no light pollution. You know where I think the southern skies must be phenomenal. Must be phenomenal to be able to see the the, Mil- the Milky Way. I love kayaking, so I love to be in in nature. I've, I've been growing up. As if you're, if you're a little bit familiar with Belgium, uh, it's a it's a country by the coastline. So I grew up I grew up at the North Sea. Uh, I've been an instructor of uh, sailing in the past, so I love water. Uh, that's kind of the draw for me, a big draw to um, to be on the water in in nature, close to the close to uh, the fauna and the flora of uh, of Antarctica. I've also, you know, I you may be familiar, but I've actually been involved and been asked to um, to see if we could bring ultrasound to space. At some point, we were the first to submit a paper, the first paper to radiology from space. Uh, I kind of look at Antarctica as the same thing. It's, it's space is something you know far away. Antarctica is far away. It's unpolluted. It, it's what draws me to it, and it, and the fact that you can bring ultrasound equipment there and learn at the same time, very similar to bringing ultrasound in space and being able to um, to do a shoulder ultrasound on an astronaut. Uh, you're not going to bring an MRI or a CT unit in space. You know, you bring you bring whatever you, whatever is compact and small enough, and and the same thing I, I think hold for, uh, holds for holds the, for the South Pole. In the 90s, you may remember the story of um, Lynn Nielsen, the American physician who was there who developed breast uh, cancer. Yes, I do at remember the South that. Pole who was who was doing her own treatment and had taken her biopsy. What if she had had an ultrasound unit, been able to detect it much earlier? If she had a handheld ultrasound, which she didn't have, um, you know, it may have saved her life uh, uh, at that time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I'm working with you on this program in Antarctica, and then John Jacobson is coming too, and Kevin Ingalls. You know, something that my inspiration for this program, in addition to everything you've already said, is that you know, learning in and of itself is a state of mind. And nothing puts you into more of a state of mind than being in an unfamiliar environment. And no one's familiar with that environment. You know, everybody's been to, you know, San Diego. Everybody's been to Boston. Everybody's been to Chicago. We know what to expect. Well, that, you know, hindbrain of ours that's working to uh, instigate our, our instincts there is really open up when you're in that situation, in my opinion. So I... I think there's not going to be any other uh, environment that is more apt to learning than being in Antarctica or some similar situation where you're going to be around all of these people that are interested in ultrasound of the musculoskeletal system and talking about it for 10 days straight. No doubt. Now, something that I've experienced in my practice and, you know, obviously in my area geographically, MSK ultrasound isn't as developed as it is at Henry Ford. A lot of people get denied by the insurance company for an ultrasound until they do, or I mean, a MRI until they do, you know, physical therapy and, you know, they have to, you know, have six weeks of, of treatment, but the insurance company never denies the ultrasound. (laughs) So many patients that come to me and even being sent by the doctor are skeptical of the ultrasound but they have to do it because they want to get the ultrasound to get the MRI. Do you have that similar experience or do you, are you seeing that where you're at? Well, we've, we've really not seen much of that because we were so early, we were early adopters mm-hmm. of it. But what we've seen though is that uh, repeatability, the fact that, you know, patients with, it's, it's, I think some of those studies were actually developed in St. Louis, is that if you have shoulder pain on one side, because of rotator cuff disease, your chances of, of having within a year or so having shoulder pain on the opposite side, I think maybe like 30, 40% of patients do have that. And once you have a shoulder with, with pain, it starts with a little little tear, the tail becomes bigger, so you need repeated all repeated examinations. It's very hard mm-hmm. to do two or three MRs for, per year for um, 
for shoulder pain. It's also very difficult because, as you well know, when rotator cuff surgery is done, it may take care of the pain, but sometimes the pain comes back. You know, is the, is the, the reconstruction torn or not? So, again, uh, post-operative um, imaging is sometimes a challenge. It's not easy because you get a lot of hemocytorin in the tissues, and that, that is, makes the, the diagnosis very difficult. Ultrasound is not hampered by... Uh, uh, hemocytorin is also not hampered by metal implants or anything that distorts the image from the you know from the surgical device part. So that these sort of issues we run into frequently. Yes. Yeah, and I'm I'm seeing that here too as well. You know, a lot of my probably ten percent of my practice is post op shoulder and post op elbow. So yeah. that's that's been something. And 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 again, you know, you learn from every one of those cases. Yeah, and also claustrophobic patients. You know, that was one of the first things when people were skeptical. They uh, orthopedics, seven orthopedic surgeons were skeptical for their patients, but then they were not so skeptical when, when one of their family members was uh, had shoulder pain and they needed an imaging. They they seemed to be then very prompt in sending them for for ultrasound because ultrasound really there is no claustrophobia aspect to it. Yeah, that's that's another indication that we get here frequently. And then also patient preference. You know, we do have some patients that have actually gotten out there and read about ultrasound of the MSK system and are, you know, very interested in having it done. So then they prompt their doctor, hey, I want to get this. And, um, you know, the doctor then learns about it because a lot of doctors don't know about it, uh, That especially if they're not radiologists or orthopedics or something. So, yeah, we, we do see that too. Are you able to, to share some of your experiences uh, negotiating with insurance companies or how how you and the hospital have come together to get reimbursements or indicate, you know, certain certain benefits or, you know, how, how have you had these discussions to get paid for your huh? MSK ultrasound? Actually, I would rather turn this question back to you because you, as a private <laughs> practice practitioner, you know, has probably have a lot of experience in bargaining with, in the local market. I actually have been reaping the benefits of a market that is now used to our practice for 30 years. Musculoskeletal ultrasound is very, very well uh, accepted for any single joint in the Detroit area. Uh, my administrators had to fight that fight in the ni- in 1989, 1990. Uh, we showed benefits to the algorithmic workup of shoulder pain, uh, for example, and surgeons took our patients straight to uh, to surgery after the ultrasound, so they couldn't confirm our findings. Uh, insurances didn't need much convincing if their patients with rotator cuff disease were treated at Ernie Ford at a fraction of the price compared to treatment at surrounding practices, often with improved outcomes. I mean, the out- outcomes were not my <laughs> were not my doing. We had very good surgeons, but if those very good surgeons were relying on our ultrasound for making diagnosis, and they were taking the patient right to to surgery without any any other imaging technique. That uh, you know, when the when they saw the when the insurances saw the cost being dropping, that what well, didn't need much convincing. Same thing for workman's comp when they saw their patients go back to work quicker, did not have to wait on the MR, um, and and we were effectively and appropriately making the diagnosis that didn't need. You know, right now we have very good administrative support at Henry Ford. Our physicians, I'm not the only one. You know, we are a team of about ten of them that actually each of them knows how to use ultrasound. You know, we need a reminder sometimes whether the, when the sonographer has done a limited study and we dictate a complete study, those things, uh, or vice versa, when um, a complete study <clears throat> was uh, uh, built by the sonographer and then we read it as, a, as an incomplete or as a focus study, then, you know... Uh, Typically, the rules are that you have to comment on tendon, on a muscle, on joint, anatomy. So we need those reminders sometimes. Uh, we, every year, we need the reminders when Medicare changes the rules. You know, there used to be a time when we were billing for diagnostic and then billing for the interventional, and then there were two different codes for that. And we, it made sense because I really think the advantage of the imaging there is that you can see it, and if you can see it, you can treat it. Right now, we only billing for the for the intervention, uh, which again doesn't make sense in my in my mind. But that's that's the way the rules work. But right, I've been benefiting from from that relationship. 
Yeah, I think a lot of that's applicable to my uh, outpatient setting too. You know, again, it's unfortunate that an outpatient-based lab or outpatient-based imaging center gets lumped in with, you know, a um, the same environment as an orthopedic surgeon's office where they're going to do the injection if there's an ultrasound or not. So then, you know, what we're doing is we're saying, hey, this this is a diagnosis and it is amenable to an injection or other procedure. And then they aren't going to pay for, you know, the diagnostic part, which is 95% of the time, you know, because as you know, it doesn't take long to do an injection. Exactly. So yeah, that's, that's interesting. And on an outpatient basis, you know, if somebody, I, a lot of the times for uh, like workman's comp, you know, those are a little bit more forgiving because you can show if you send the patient to me here today uh, with an with an order to do a uh, complete shoulder and then an injection, if indicated, you're going to save all this time. And so that's been my main negotiation with them. And yeah, we don't get paid the full amount that you know the seven six eight eight one or the or you know the uh, the interventional code is going to pay, but we we do get a better reimbursement from them. So I think that is an opportunity for. Um, radiologists or interventional radiologists and, you know, musculoskeletal interventional radiologists or even, you know, general radiologists out in the outpatient area to use MSK ultrasound. And then it also does build your business relationship with other referring doctors. They love it. I mean, the, just the, the advantages of it, they absolutely love it. So thank you so much for being on the show today, Marnix. I'm really looking forward to seeing, are you, are you having a fall conference? Yes, we have a fall conference in, uh, on, uh, November 10 and November 11 is going to be on shoulder imaging. It's going to be again focused on being an open forum where sonographers and physicians, they mix and they learn from each other and, you know, very, very level. Everybody speaks up, everybody discusses and learns uh, in, a, in a setting like that. As yeah, and where's that going to be this year or this time? Bay City, Michigan. Bay City, Michigan. Okay, great. And then... For the listeners, where can they find out more information about that online? Well, for those that are on Facebook, just, uh, you know, I always go by musculoskeletal ultrasound. That's kind of my <laughs> trade name. If you go to musculoskeletal ultrasound, or if you're not on Facebook, you, if you just type in HTTPS forward forward slash point of care imaging dot US, and the US stands for US, United States, or ultrasound US. Great. And then for those interested, in the Antarctica conference, I can just share that information since I have it. Uh, that's going to be in January of 2024, January 20th. And uh, any listeners interested in checking that out, they can go to iame.com uh, slash Antarctica, or they can reach out by email to our conference coordinator, j at bhconferencing.com. It's been great to uh, hear from you again, Marnix. I look forward to seeing you this fall and uh, also putting together the rest of the program for Antarctica. Fun working with you. Good talking. Good seeing you. Have a great weekend. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable MSK on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Jacob Fleming, and co-hosts Michael Barraza and Chris Beck. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhirter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and show notes written by Marvi Espiritu and Anne Dang. Administrative support provided by Jinwoo Kennebrew. Thanks again and see you next time.